Okay. Hello, everybody. So today I'm going to be talking about overtones and the harmonic series and a couple related things to that. So before we start off, um, I want to give a brief overview of what sound is physically, because I know a lot of you may not uh, have like a great idea of a lot of the math and science behind sound. So just to start, uh, whenever we draw sound, we typically draw sound in this sort of a wave pattern. And what this wave pattern really represents is compressions of air. So at these points, crests, we have high pressure, basically a little band of high pressure air. And in the valleys, the troughs, we have low pressure. So whenever you speak or whenever a sound is produced, basically what you have is an alternating series of high pressure and low pressure waves, which travel through the air from the source to, you know, whatever person is listening. And then your ear interprets this as sound. So uh, I want to diagram a couple things just so everybody's using the everybody's same terminology. Using the same uh, can terminology. everybody please mute uh, yourself? Can everybody please themselves? mute yourself? I can hear myself. I can hear myself. There we go. Okay. So to start, uh, let's define what wavelength is. I think wavelength is probably a helpful word. So wavelength is very simply the length of one oscillation. So this unit right here is one wavelength, which sometimes is lambda. So that's a wavelength. It's literally just the physical distance in meters or whatever unit you have between uh, you know, one oscillation. Similarly, the time that it takes for the wave to go, to undergo one wavelength, in other words, one full oscillation, is called the period. So this unit is also the period, which is a measurement of time. So the period for your wave might be, you know, 0.1 milliseconds. And similarly, uh, related to period, so the period is also written as T, capital T, uh, if we do if we do one divided by t, we get the frequency f, which is uh, in hertz. And typically, frequency is what we use when we're describing sound. You, I'm sure many of you have heard of a equals 440 hertz. What that means is that the sound wave for the note a is oscillating. 440 times every second, 440 hertz. So those are the general ideas about sound. So uh, let's talk about overtones for a second. So whenever you're producing a sound, your sound is not going to be a simple wave like this. Uh, so this wave right here is called a sine wave. Oh, where did it go? That was bizarre. So this is called a sine wave. And I'll play for you what a sound wave sounds like now that I have this handy dandy app. Let me turn off this one. 440. Can everybody hear that? Let me just make sure. Yes, it is Max Music. I uh, just got this today. Can you guys hear it? Oh, dang. Okay, let's figure this out. Um, can you please mute yourself, Nehrun? Thank you. Share computer sound. Uh, yes, I was playing A equals 440. I'm not sure why it's not sharing my, stream, my screen sound. Let me end the stream and, re and reboot. Okay, go live, screens. Hmm. 
Hmm. I'm gonna hit the play button again. Can you hear that? You have to be kidding me. I thought it worked earlier when we tried this. Spore said that he could hear it earlier. Um, okay. Let me try one more thing. Change screen. There we go. Go live. Okay. How about now? Can you hear it now? All right. Is it, uh, how's the volume? Is the volume reasonable? Because I'm going to be using this app a couple times. So this is what a sine wave sounds like. This is playing A equals 440 hertz. As you can tell, it's kind of boring. Um, and most things do not sound like that in real life. Um, you cannot hear it. I don't know. F major 7. Someone's going to have to help you with that. Okay. So now I need to change my screen to go back to my... Oh, this is going to be inconvenient. Okay. Whatever. It's like a computer boop is what it sounds like. But in real life, uh, nothing looks like this. In real life, everything looks messy. So... Now your wave might look something like this. I don't know. The general idea is that your wave is going to have lots of little crests and troughs, and it's not going to be very clean. And to understand this, we need to understand uh, the harmonic series and what overtones are. So visually, what the harmonic series looks like is this. So imagine we have a string. Okay. So here's our string. So maybe I'll draw in red is like where the string would be at rest, and then in black is where the string is going to bend to after we pluck it, right? This, the string after we pluck it on like a guitar or something bends up and down. That's the first overtone. However, there are more than that overtone. So for example, if we pluck it in a special way, we could get it so the string bends like that. That would be called the first overtone for the second part. Uh, can you please mute yourself when joining the chat? Thank you. And there's infinitely many of these overtones, though, of course, after a certain point, it just becomes kind of pointless to think of them that high. Um, but basically, for any integer, so any whole number, there is an overtone. So again, this is what the first overtone might look like, and then you might have this etc., etc., going down the line. And so this applies to music by basically multiplying the frequency by an integer. So let's say your note on the guitar was A equals 110 hertz. The next overtone would be A equals 220 hertz, one octave above. The next note would be an E, which is 330 hertz, and I think that you guys can get the sort of pa the pattern there. So I'll just briefly write out uh, some of the first overtones in the series as their note names, just so you guys can get a sense of what the overtones might sound like. Um, and then I'll play you an example, because Wikipedia has uh, free audio that I'm going to steal. So the fundamental note is what is that equals 110. Then, as we go up, we would get A an octave higher. So this would be an A2. Then we would have A3 equals 220. E3 equals 330. I'm not going to write the hertz anymore, uh, just because you get the pattern. We have A4, C sharp uh, 5. Oops. E5, and then this note, which is G, uh, G5-ish, so I'll just put like a little star there. Uh, this G5 is very flat. 
and then we would have uh, a6. And again, this pattern could continue on and on and on. And you'll notice that anytime we have a power of two, so this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Whenever we have these powers of two, uh, we have another octave. And that's because the octave has the ratio two to one. So doubling the frequency gives you the next octave. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna pull out Desmos. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys use Desmos, but it's a really nice graphing software, and I'm going to link this uh, little model at the end. Can you guys see uh, Desmos? It's like a graphy thing. Okay. So uh, I have these sliders. So this slider right here, let me turn, let me uh, change which ones are active right now. Uh, so this is our fundamental frequency right here, okay? So think of the amplitude, like how tall the sine wave is, as like the volume. But more, more accurately, it's uh, the pressure at that point. Uh, but higher pressure would be higher volume. So you can think of that as volume too. So in red, this, that would be the first overtone or the fundamental frequency. Here in, in yellow, we have the next one. So as you can see, uh, now the hertz is doubled. So the wave is going twice as fast. Um, by the way, the black dotted lines represent like one period. So all of these waves have a period of two units. As you can see, the pattern repeats every two squares. Um, then in red, in green, I'm gonna turn off the yellow one. In green, we have the third overtone. So as you can see, there are three peaks before we hit the black dotted line. So it repeats three times. And then the fourth overtone would be here in blue. And again, it's repeating four times. So we can combine these overtones. And in real life, you would be adding, you know, basically all of the overtones, you know, up to infinity or at least some large number. So let's see what happens when we add some overtones together. So I'm going to turn off some of these guys. So in red, we have our pure sine wave. And now I'm going to overlay that with the composite. So in purple, we have the composite, adding all of the waves uh, together. So let's turn up this blue slider and see what happens. So I'm adding the uh, next overtone, the second overtone in yellow and as i add yellow you see the purple which is the resultant sound changes so again i'll turn turn these guys off these are the two composite overtones right we have the fundamental in red and, the, and then the overtone above that in yellow and when we add them together we get this sort of funky dude and this is more accurately what sound looks like in real life and so we can add some other overtones let's say we add the third overtone in green. So when we add the third overtone to that, we might get something spiky like this. Maybe we decide to turn off the second overtone for a little bit. Goodbye. So there's lots of shapes that you can create with this just by sliding different overtones. And I'm going to link this uh, little interactive model. Uh, after the presentation so that you guys can fiddle around with it and just get a feel for what might happen when you add overtones. Um, and again, this is just the first four overtones. In real life, you'd be adding infinitely many. So now let me play. I'm going to go to the Wikipedia page for the harmonic series. I'm going to play you what the harmonic series sounds like. Hopefully you guys can hear it. I'm probably going to have to change my window or something. Oh no, harmonic series, music, not math, though related. And let me just check chat to see. Wouldn't the next overtones be less loud? In what context? What a remote overtone does? You mean like a, like a very high numbered overtone? 
Sure. So I'm just going to change this overtone to be, I don't know, 13. So let's say 13. i got to change it here too. So instead of the fourth overtone, we'll have the 13. And there you go. So let me turn off all the other guys. So let's just say we had the fundamental with the 13th overtone. It would look something like this. There you go. So it's kind of cool looking, actually, if you think about it. Um, the bigger wave pattern is the fundamental frequency, which is what you would hear. But there's also that little other dude that's giving it uh, some microwaviness. So that's just one. Uh, yeah, it is noisy. Then the more, the louder your overtones are, the more noisy it is. So this is a very loud 13th overtone, which would be unusual. If we turn down the 13th overtone to a more reasonable level, you can see we just kind of get a jagged fine wave. So again, you guys can play with this. I'm going to link this uh, when we're done. Um, basically, all I have set up is just sine of basically number times pi x, and that number is your overtone. And then you can just adjust the sliders to adjust the amplitude. Uh, wouldn't the effectiveness be only as far as we can hear? What do you mean by effectiveness? I mean, generally what happens is just the higher the, the overtones go, um, the less volume they have and the less importance they have. Yes, no, there is a lot of inf interference. And I'm going to talk about inter interference in a little bit with respect to tartini tones and beat frequencies. There's a lot of typing, so I'm just going to wait and see what everybody's typing. Would we hear the interference if they are higher than we can hear? Uh, potentially, yes, actually. Though I really hope that the piccolo players aren't playing that high. <laughs> Um, just going to see what Nirion is typing, and then I'm going to move on to play. Oh, stop typing. So I'm going to switch my screen here so that you guys can hear what the Overtone series sounds like. So let's see if I can do this. Um, Microsoft Edge? No. No, I don't want that. Maybe I do want that. Go live. Do you see anything? I don't know. Probably not. Change screen. Oh, uh, yes, this is very physics y. Oh, you see Desmos. Can you see harmonic series? I'm going to play this little uh, doodad. Let me find where it is. No overtones. Maybe it's on the overtones page. Here it is. Uh, I'm going to play it. Tell me if you guys can hear it. Hopefully you can. Could you guys hear that? Cool. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about instruments uh, late, a little later in the lecture and probably in fuller detail in future lessons. Yes, so as you can tell, um, most of the lower overtones are pretty uh, nice sounding. You know, they're just intervals, that sort of thing. Uh, the higher the intervals go, though, um, Generally, they sound kind of out of tune because they don't really fit into traditional notes. Like I said, um, the seventh overtone is not exactly a minor seventh. It's a very flat minor seventh. And so it's actually given its own interval name. It's called the harmonic sound. It comes from this harmonic series. 
So let me switch my screen again. It's really unfortunate that I have to switch my screen for you guys to hear it, but I guess it does be like that. My computer is really overheating. It does not like OBS. Um, SIY is typing. We'd still hit more octaves and more multiples of 3 of 5. Um, what do you mean? Oh, yes. Yeah, I understand what you mean now. Yeah. No, of course. Um, I mean, the same overtone, like notes. So like in the overtone series for A, we would go A, A, E, A, C sharp, E, G, A. And so the A is going to be repeated a lot. E is going to be repeated a lot. C sharp is going to be repeated a lot, etc. So a lot of, there are, I guess, what we would call in-tune harmonics um, in there, but generally the higher you go, the more of them are just kind of like blah. We don't want to talk about it. Okay. So just to briefly touch on a little bit of the consonant stuff that we talked about last time, uh, the harmonic series is one theory for how uh, Gregorian monks uh, first developed Western ideas about consonants. So if you ever um, sing, so like I said, when you, whenever you sing, you're not singing a pure sine wave. That's not true. You're singing a series of overtones. You know, so maybe your singing looks something like this, etc. And so this can be decomposed into a fundamental and then maybe some other overtones. And so Gregorian monks, when they're in these great cathedrals, uh, can hear their echoes. And oftentimes, as they're switching notes, they can hear their own overtones and play in tune with them. Not play, uh, sing. And so it's theorized that it was the aligning of overtones that first convinced Gregorian monks to sing in perfect fifths and major thirds to try to achieve that overtonal harmony, if you will. Yeah, so overtone singing is basically just changing the format of your mouth in order to amplify a specific overtone, creating the illusion of singing multiple notes when in reality you're just focusing the single note that you're singing. And I am going to talk about overtone singing in the future because uh, formands are a very uh, good way to talk about spectralism and sound decomposition. Yeah. So that's probably going to be more next lecture stuff. Um, but so now I want to talk about beat frequencies and virtual pitch and that sort of thing. So let me go back to my Desmos for a second and bring something up. So let me turn off this guy. So let's say that I, I need to fix this after a, my example for Caterpus. All right, so let's say we have the fundamental you know, so here's our fundamental sine wave. Um, and let's say instead, actually, no, let's say we don't want the fundamental. And let's say we're a musician and we are playing an A3. I want it to be zero, be zero. There we go. We're playing an A3. So maybe this is what our A3 looks like, okay? Now let's say we're a second musician. We decide to play a perfect fifth above them, which would be given by this yellow sine wave. Oop. I need to turn off some things. Sorry, yellow is the A3, and maybe this is what an E3 looks like. So overlapped, you can see right away that they seem to have a period of two, despite neither of them having that same period. I mean wavelength, sorry. And when we add them, this is what we get. So I'll turn off yellow and green so you can see. So this is an A3 an A3 plus an E3. But notice, looking at it, the period has the same, uh, the period and wavelength are the same as that of what you would think of as the fundamental, which would be an A2. So again, let's look at these individually. Here, the wavelength is 1, because every time it goes 0 to 1, it repeats. 1 to 2 repeats. For this guy, the wavelength would be uh, something else. I don't know, probably two thirds. So two thirds, two thirds, two thirds, and it keeps repeating every two thirds units. 
but when we add them together, their addition has a period of two. And the interesting thing about this is that to our ears, it actually tricks us into thinking that the fundamental is there. In other words, the, the musicians are playing in A3, playing in a, an E3, but our ears also hear an A2 below them. And this phenomenon is known as the beat frequency. So to give you a little bit of math behind this, to calculate the beat, uh, sorry, if you join chat, can you please mute yourself so we do not hear? would be much appreciated. Let me check to see if anyone has questions. Negative, okay. So to calculate the beat, we are gonna take the first frequency and subtract it from the second frequency. Those are absolute value bars, and that's our beat. So in this example, here's 330, which is an E3, minus 220, which is an A2, or A3. Wait a second, my octaves are wrong. E4 minus A3 is equal to 110, which is the fundamental, A2. And in general, we can do this for, you know, any two notes that we plugged in there. They don't have to be part of the same overtones. And the reason for this is because subtracting them, subtracting the two notes, gives us the frequency of basically the simplest harmonic series that they both fit into. So let's listen to an example. So I'll change my, my uh, screen so we can hear this a little bit. And hopefully you guys can hear it. I know that I certainly can, but I don't know how well it will come through stream. So... Let's listen to this. So here is A equals 440. Can you guys hear? Okay. Now, I'm going to play one of them a perfect fifth above. So boom, boom. So I'll change this to 660. And theoretically, we should hear a beat frequency, which is one octave below. So it can, it's kind of hard to hear, so I'm going to change it to 220 so you know exactly what to listen for. Ugh, I hate this app. So this is the note you guys are listening for. And headphones, it's going to be a lot better and easier to hear if you're using headphones. So think about this pitch, keep it in your, in your mind for a second. And now I'm going to play the chord. So I don't know if you guys can hear that at all, but if you have a good audio system, you should be able to hear faintly a virtual pitch, which is, um, yes, the difference between hertz. Um, I, don't, I don't really want to open up Audacity, but if you play it in Audacity, you can hear it really, really well. Yeah, so that's the thing, is the 20, 220 hertz sound isn't actually there. Uh, no, B frequency works probably best with headphones, at least in my experience. Um, but yeah, so the 220 hertz sound isn't there, which is interesting, but you can hear it faintly. It's, it's an illusion of sorts. Um, and that just comes from, you know, there's some physics behind it, like I showed you in Desmos, but it mostly comes from our brain being, uh, trying to make some shortcuts in decomposing the sound in our heads. Um, let's do another example. I'll maybe uh, change it up a little bit. So, hmm. generally the higher you go, the easier it is to hear it. So, headphone users, you are, you are hereby warned.
I don't know if, can you guys hear that? So in, in this example, you're listening for again, boom, that same low 200 hertz sound. Maybe you can hear it a little better now. I think you also might be able to notice something else. Not only do you hear a little boom, but you also hear a boom, like the fifth of the chord. So notice right now I'm playing an 800 hertz note, which let's say that that corresponds to C. And I'm playing a 1000 hertz note, which would correspond to E, if that's the key that we're working on. When we play them, we should only hear a major third. You know, C, E, or uh, sorry, C, E. But we can hear the fifth of the chord. Listen again. You can hear it a little bit. And that note does not exist. Nowhere in here am I playing that note. So this phenomenon is a little bit different from the beat frequency, but it is related. Uh, these are called Tartini tones, um, after the violinist that first discovered them when messing around with his violin. So uh, maybe I can try to show you what a Tartini tone looks like, but it's a little bit harder to visualize. Uh, I'm going to have to do some trickery here. So I'll use the example that we just listened to. Oh, this actually makes the B frequency look amazing. So maybe you can see that a little better now. Um, so here's the example that we just listened to. Notice that, uh, so here's the two, the two uh, notes that we played. So here is the C and here's the E. And when we add them together, uh, do you see the big blobbin? We have some big blobs, and th that big blob would be the beat frequency. Now, to see the Tartini tones is a little more a little more difficult, and honestly, I don't really know if I can really visualize it here. It's not appearing. It's a lot easier to see with just like mathiness, but if you, I'll show you the math behind it. It's a little bit similar to this, but basically, if we add frequencies together, we'll get our resultant. So instead of subtracting the two to get our beat, we can add frequencies to get a resultant. So if we add, we get a tartini. So in our example, we would expect- Dude, I hate to do this, but we can't see your screen. Oh, thank you. Sorry. I hate switching screens. This makes it terrible. Okay, so uh, I got to show you the picture again then. All right, <clears throat> so here's the example of uh, Purple Blobby Boy. So this is what we just listened to, and you can see the beat frequency appears because we have these big purple blobs with wavelength equal to 2. So the Tartini tone is a, a lot harder to visualize, even though a lot of the times you can hear it maybe a little stronger. Um, so I'll give you some of the math behind this. So if we add the two frequencies together, we get like the main Tartini tone, if you will. So in our example, we listen to 800 hertz plus 1000 hertz would be equal to 1800 hertz. Um, but that's not really what we're listening for. At least that's not what uh, we want to hear that's not what we're hearing with the perfect fifth what we are actually hearing is a tartini tone with the beat frequency if that makes sense so our beat let's calculate our beat frequency first so our beat frequency is going to be a thousand minus 800 is equal to 200 hertz so that's the beat Now, let's say we substitute this guy, uh, sorry, wrong one, that guy, for one of the frequencies. So now we have 200 plus 1,000 is equal to, and then we would get 12,000 hertz for a Tartini tone. And this does create the perfect fifth, because if you recall, 
200 is, let's say, C. That would make 800 also equal to C, just two octaves higher. And then a perfect fifth above that would be 800 times 3 halves, which gives us 1200 hertz. And that's the perfect fifth that you can kind of hear. So Tartini tones are really interesting because a lot of the times you actually create Tartini tones with the beat frequency and create additional sounds that really aren't there. And a lot of these Tartini tones and beat frequencies, again, in like an orchestral setting, you're not going to really hear them. Um, but in a barbershop quartet, for example, you can very clearly hear a Tartini tone or a beat frequency if the, uh, the quartet's significantly skilled. Um, any professional quartet, realistically, you should be able to hear those sorts of things because of how well in tune they are. So are we hearing the Tartini tone octaves below like, below like 900 or 450 hertz? What do you mean by that? Um, I also don't understand what you mean by that question, Caterpus. Yeah, so you can hear the 1800 hertz. I think it's a little bit harder because of how high-pitched it is. Uh, naturally, things are going to just sound to the human ear uh, quieter if they're too low or too high. Um, so the G that we were hearing at 1200 hertz is kind of like the perfect zone for the human ear to hear. Uh, so the G is the main, the loudest Tartini tone, at least in that example. And the loudness of a Tartini tone or the B frequency is mostly a human ph physiology thing. Um, it has nothing really to do with any physics because, like I said, it's an illusion more than anything. Um, so again, you can hear the 1800 hertz. It's just in that example, the easiest ones to hear would probably be the B frequency at 200 and then the Tartini tone at 1200. Uh, you'll also notice that if we calculated the Tartini tone for the other dude, 800... Uh, we would get a thousand hertz, which just happens to be the second uh, frequency that we were playing. So that frequency, obviously, you wouldn't hear that as a Tartini tone because we're already playing it. So generally, the things that you hear are the Tartini tones that the beat frequency makes with any of the played frequencies. And the interesting thing also to note is the Tartini tone is can be pretty much any or it has to be within one of the harmon one of the harmonics of the beat frequency so it's almost like your human ear is extrapolating the two notes you hear into an entire spectrum of overtones uh yes there are multiple tartini tones in a single chord what kind of variables influence the way that we perceive tartini tones um, I'll be honest, I have no idea. I'm not a biologist, so I can't give you any physiology there. Uh, and then at Caterpus, I, th I mean that we kind of expect them at some innate level, and that allows for some, some theory stuff to work. Um, I still don't 100% know what you're getting at, but... Again, the Tartini tones are really kind of like an extrapolation of the overtone series of the fundamental slash B frequency. So in that way, yeah, it's kind of like filling out the overtones. To, to some extent, Caterpus, and I'm going to provide some counterexamples to that sort of idea because a lot of instruments really do not follow a strict overtone series, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit here. So I'm going to 
give some examples here. I wonder, I, I, I have a guitar with me, and I'm not sure if you guys are really going to be able to see me. Um, but I'm going to attempt to. I'm going to pull out a guitar, and I'm going to aim my camera at a guitar. And maybe give you some examples here. This is probably wildly out of tune. Um, yes, I would say so. To, Cater to you, Caterpus. Um, a timpani has wildly out of tune overtones, as would a, a bell or a chime, and so those sound a little more dissonant. Okay, let me try to modify this camera here. So I'm going to end stream and try to pull up a camera here. How do I do that? Great question. Hmm. Uh, it doesn't really have to do with the quality of the tympano. It has to do with the shape. Uh, any circular drum is going to have out-of-tune harmonics. Um, just by nature of the circle, the first overtone is about 1.6 times larger than it should be. Um, the quality of the tympano is going to allow you to tune it more accurately and maybe have more resonance, but it's not going to tune the harmonics. Okay, I don't really see how I'm supposed to share my uh, camera, so I'm going to give up on that idea. But uh, when it, pr pretend, visualize with me, pretend that what I'm doing makes sense. So I'm going to play. Basically, here's a, here's the guitar string. So when I play the guitar string. the guitar string wobbles up and down. Now I can place my finger halfway down the guitar neck and not place it on the fret, but actually just place it. Oh, sorry, and we would get... I don't know how well you can hear that. But that's basically the second overtone. So now the string is going like this. But what's interesting with the guitar and one of the physical limitations of these sorts of instruments is they're not actually in the center. You don't want to, or, you know, in exactly whatever node you want, because the guitar and other related instruments to it uh, have a little bit of dead length at the end of their, at the end of the string. So to show you what I mean, let's say I zoomed in on this part of the guitar. So here's here's the fret. I don't know. Here, let's just say that this is the end of the string. Okay. So the string ends here. When I pluck the string, the string does not go like this. It does not wobble like that because it's being tied down. And the way that it's tied down actually makes it go like this. So there's a little little uh, length right here of dead string. And so for string players and guitar manufacturers, uh, you have to be co cognizant of that because you can't just place the frets at the exact, you know, integer ratios that you would expect your, yourself to be able to. And in fact, that length of dead string will change, uh, you know, given the thickness of the string, the material of the string. So it's very important for your fret placement and for your guitar that you're using the right kind of strings associated with it. And actually, uh, some high-level guitars are constructed in such a way that the frets are slightly uh, angled. So instead of being straight bars, they're slightly curved. This is an extreme exaggeration, but they might be slightly curved like this. And that's just because there's, uh, you know, this dead length of the string. So the guitar is one example in which you might expect pure overtones, but there are some physical limitations. Let me see if there's any questions. Don't frets force certain frequencies to come out versus violins? Uh, so the fret as it's intended to be played is basically just changing the length of the string that you pluck. But if let's say I just put my finger on the string, which is what I wanted to show, 
uh, it would be creating a node, which would artificially make it wobble at a harmonic, even if I let go. So again, I really wish you could see it, but let's say I'm placing my finger in the middle of the guitar, pluck the note, and then I release it, and it doesn't change its vibrating because it's it's vibrating at the sec at the next overtone. I really w I should have set this up better. Oh well. Uh, so let me talk about some wind instruments now too. So if anybody's a woodwind instrument, uh, like clarinet, for example, you may know that you can't play every harmonic. So for the brass instruments, you know, the trombone, the trumpet, you can play each partial, each harmonic. So the trombonist can play B flat one is the fundamental. And then above that, he can play the B flat two, the F two, B flat three, D three, et cetera, et cetera all in, in, you know, first position, open valve, whatever you want to call it. The clarinet player in the same fingering cannot hit all of those partials. In fact, the clarinet player could only hit the odd numbered ones. So let's say you had a low clarinet, bass clarinet. Maybe it plays a B flat one, then an F two, then a D three, then, you know, approximately an A flat three, and then Above that, maybe a C, four. And so it can only play the odd numbered ones. These are the numbers of the, the overtones. And the reason for that has to do with the fact that a clarinet is what we call a closed pipe instrument. So in a trombone, the trombone can be thought of, or you know, trumpet or whatever, as basically just a long tube. So the wave in this tube goes something like this. And the overtones might be like this. So at the ends, we have uh, this sort of open shape. This is the end. The clarinet and a lot of other reeded instruments are closed at one end. So if this was the tubing for a clarinet, maybe one end is closed. So then the clarinet can play this as the first overtone, or the fundamental, and then this would be their next partial. Oops, uh, undo. So notice that this, if we think of the period as being like this, so that's B flat one, now we have <clears throat> three little segments here, or five, et cetera, et cetera. And so because we can only have basically half wavelengths, um, the clarinet and other closed pipe instruments can only play odd overtones. So something good to be aware of. Um, there's not really much more I, I want to say on that right now. Um, but it's just interesting to think about. What about a, with a pipe organ and some pipes are open and some pipes are closed? Uh, the organ isn't going to be playing over to, uh, partials. I'm talking about not playing, like not the overtones on top of the fundamental. I'm talking about like on a trombone in, or a trumpet in first position, you have a whole spectrum of notes you can play. And each of those notes corresponds to an overtone series. So the pipe organ isn't ever going to be playing higher partials or octaves or anything like that. It has one set note. SIY is typing. So I'm actually going to stop the recording here, but I'm going to continue to give some last thoughts and discussion to you guys because uh, where I stand right now is the next lecture um, on spectralism. I want to talk about um, overtone, uh, like overtones in terms of uh, de decomposing sound, talk more about vowels and timber and that sort of thing. Um,
and I'm going to give some examples of that and how different overtones create the unique sounds that we hear from each instrument. You know, if the guitar and a clarinet play the same note, it sounds wildly different, and that has to do with the overtones that are emphasized. And so I want to talk a lot more about that next time, but at least for this lecture, I'm going to uh, end it here. That way I don't get too far ahead of myself.